Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to cover several different topics. Um, these are all things that are relevant to uh, test number two as well as the final examination. Um, before I prepared this presentation, I went over both tests and also the chapter nine quiz just to make sure that I'm covering everything. Now this video isn't going to cover every test question, but what I'm doing here is I'm focusing on the things that are covered on the test. So it's not an exhaustive list. You still need to watch the other lectures and I'll just show you where they are here. You can see I have a lecture on noun pronoun agreement and on passive voice. I'll also have obviously this lecture and then there will be one more lecture that I will have before the chapter nine stuff is over with. Uh, this lecture, grand juries and pettit juries is really a chapter 13 topic. So when you have watched all four of these lectures, uh, these two, the one I'm doing now, and then the one I'll post later, you will have all the information really that you need to be successful on the chapter nine materials. Um, so just keep in mind when you're watching these, they're pretty focused on what's gonna be on the test. If we were in class, I would kind of meander and cover some other stuff, but um, since time is kind of short these days, I'm gonna be a little bit more surgical in my approach to questions. So here we go. We're gonna get started on slide five. Um, so this is in the PowerPoint for chapter nine. It may actually be called chapter eight, but it's the grammar chapter. And this and the ethics chapter are the two chapters in this course that I significantly supplement. All the other chapters, I'm pretty much just regurgitating what is in the textbook. So if you read the textbook, you've got 95% of the material. Usually the only things I add in those other two, uh, other, other than these two chapters, are Texas specific information. Um, but for the ethics chapter and for the grammar chapter, I do significantly supplement. So you really aren't prepared for those tests unless you've watched the lectures and looked at the PowerPoints. And I have made this PowerPoint available to you on Canvas, so you're welcome to look at it whenever you would like to. Okay, so here we're going to focus on, you uh, have uh, stopped by the uh, partner's office or the assigning attorney's office, and you've been given an assignment. And here are some questions that you want to be sure that you ask. Keep in mind that when you're being given an assignment, in, in a perfect world, the attorney would uh, kind of spend 20 minutes or at least 10 minutes organizing his or her thoughts and, and uh, anticipating the questions that you would have and thinking about resources that you ought to spend some time on and uh, making a presentation that is organized and logical and chronological and doesn't include extra stuff but includes all the stuff that you need. And so that when you visit that person, you get this really seamless presentation, and you probably would have very few questions in that world. That never, ever happens. Um, I have been on both the assigning side and the, ass the person assigning and then the person receiving the assignment. And in my recollection, I have never had a meeting where the attorney has had this very well-organized presentation, and I include myself when I was the attorney. When work is assigned to someone else, it usually means that the assigner is a little overwhelmed with work. And so he or she doesn't have 20 minutes to gaze out into the stars and plan carefully that excellent presentation. Very likely he or she spent just a minute or two of reflection thinking, Can I, is this a legit thing for me to assign to this particular person? I think so and then calls you in to, to get the assignment. So there's very little forethought in most of these times. So you will have questions. You will have lots of questions. And one of the things that you need to do when you're in this meeting is ask those questions. And um, I'll give you another, I guess, a learning example for, from my experiences. When I first started um, my career, I thought asking questions was kind of insulting to the attorney. I thought I was basically saying to the attorney, you didn't do a very good job of explaining it. I also thought it was kind of embarrassing because it suggested that I didn't know a lot. 
because if I knew a lot, I would have understood everything that the attorney just said. So because of my pride and my uh, concern with, for my relationship with the assigning attorney, I asked very few questions. I also took very few notes because again, I was raised um, where when somebody was talking to you, you maintained eye contact with them. It's hard to maintain eye contact when you're taking notes. So, um, so those factors led to, to me not making really very smart decisions. So here are some things. When you are meeting with the attorney or whomever is assigning you the project, you should be spending most of your time taking ridiculous numbers of notes. Everything that that attorney says you probably need to write down. And you may at well need to ask them, hey, slow down, or say that again, or um, I didn't catch that part, or could you spell that name, or could you spell that case? Asking those types of questions. But you'll have questions beyond that because the attorney is gonna skip facts. Uh, and it's not because they want to hide things from you. It's because he forgot that fact or he doesn't realize that fact is important because he hasn't thought about this particular issue. And then she may uh, include facts that are irrelevant just because this is kind of a, a, a train of consciousness type of experiment. So you will have significant questions, but before you leave that meeting, you ought to know the answers to these four, four questions. What should you present as the final product? Is it going to be just a meeting where you verbally tell the attorney, maybe you bring copies of cases or statutes? That oftentimes happens. That's completely legitimate. You want to know that that's how the presentation will be, though, before you prepare the 20-page memo, right? Um, or maybe it's going to be a quick email there where you just give kind of the punchline and maybe cite the case or something. Okay, that works too, but you need to know. Or maybe it's a one or two page memo, very short, not a lot of exposition, covers just the basics. Or on the other hand, maybe it is that 10 or 20 page document. So you need to know what the, uh, what the uh, format of the document is gonna be. And there may be particular issues with the format. You know, uh, does he want a single space? Does he want a double space? Does he want large margins so we can make lots of comments? Another thing to consider is the writing style. We'll talk more about this in a couple minutes, but should it be persuasive or objective? Usually you will be preparing objective documents. That may sound like that that's more important or better than persuasive documents, but really not. You prepare objective documents when you want to communicate within the law firm or when you want to communicate with the client. When you want to communicate with somebody outside of that kind of circle of trust, you're probably going to mainly be writing persuasively. Lots of times the first version of the document will be objective and then you rewrite the document so it's persuasive. Sometimes people think, well, when it's objective, I have to be completely truthful, but when it's, a, when it's persuasive, I can kind of bend the facts a little bit. You can't. It has to be 100% truthful and accurate, whether it's objective or persuasive. Accuracy is non-negotiable in the legal business. If you submit something to the court where you misrepresent a case or a statute, that is a sanctionable type matter. A person can uh, potentially lose his or her uh, law license for doing that type of behavior. It's not something acceptable and it's not something that ethical people do. So whatever you write is going to be 100% accurate, 100% um, explaining the facts of the case, whether it's persuasive or objective. Um, but you need to know which style it's going to be. It could be that the format isn't a memo at all. It could be that it's the first draft of a brief of something that's going to be filed with the court. So again, that's another example of you need to know what the end product is that you're going to prepare. And you may even want to know, well, how is that end product going to be used? Maybe that's going to be the first draft. It's supposed to be a memo, but it's going to be the first draft of the um, uh, brief that's going to uh, be attached to a particular motion. Um, and um, you also need to consider the substance of the project. Do you understand all of the ins and outs of it? There is no such thing as a dumb question. Um, many times asking that question, which you're thinking to yourself, okay, that's really stupid. He, he isn't telling me that information, so it must be super obvious. And so then you go and spend three hours trying to find the answer to that question when he could have explained it to you in five minutes. Well, how are you going to bill that time? You can't charge the client for the time that you spent 
uh, discovering, quote unquote, discovering stuff that you should have already known, or at least that was readily available to you. So you need to suck it up and ask the question. Better that you ask a dumb question at the beginning of the assignment than um, at the end of the assignment, right? Um, we always are under time constraints. We never have an unlimited budget. You know, if we were working in the automotive industry, the output that we would produce would be cars and trucks and motorcycles and things like that. In our business, what we produce is time. What we produce is uh, the fruits of our hours of labor. And um, most of us will be billing based upon time, although there are some people who don't bill um, some legal professionals who don't bill based upon time, but most common way is an hourly fee situation. So even when your law firm maybe has less work than usual, um, there isn't an infinite amount of time because every hour you work should be billed to the client. And so if, you, if it takes you 10 hours to do something that should have only taken five hours, your law firm is going to have to write off five hours of your time. And that's five hours you could have been spent doing something productive for the law firm. So even when there are no constraints, there are constraints. And the real world is in most law firms, people are really, really busy and there are lots of deadlines. And so you don't have the 10 hours. You have the five hours, maybe. Maybe you only have three hours. And so it really requires um, a time on task focus. And so you have to constantly be evaluating, okay, I have four hours to do this. My first hour I'm going to spend on this, my second hour I'm going to spend on this, my third hour I'm going to spend on this. And if you find yourself sliding on your schedule, you're going to have to say, okay, I need to get back on track or I need to let the attorney know that I'm going to need more time. And sometimes there may be some flexibility and you can get more time, sometimes there won't be. It's a court-imposed deadline. you got to meet it whether you like it or not. Sometimes the client is going to impose time deadlines, and these again can be two, number two styles. One can be, I want the answer immediately, and the other can be, I don't care so much about when I get the answer, but I'm not willing to pay a lot for the answer. Both of those put time constraints on you, but they're different types of time constraints. So understanding the time aspect is really important as you are getting the assignment. Now we're going to go ahead to slide seven. And this is about the two styles of writing. I've already mentioned them, objective and persuasive. They're both equally important. One is not better than the other. They both have their role in um, a, a law practice. Um, so I wanted to flag that for you. So you're aware that this slide gives you kind of the answer to the differences between these questions. Now we're going to go ahead to 13. This is a really important slide. This and 26 are probably the most important slides for this particular PowerPoint. Plain English writing is a term you may have heard in other classes. It is not a term that is uh, ex expressly limited to the law. You'll hear this in English classes, history classes, journalism classes, other places where we talk about plain English. Plain English is a good thing. I think it got started kind of as a movement in the 1970s and really was, was a pretty powerful movement, has been since the 1980s. If you practice with an attorney who went to law school in the 1970s, and there's not many of them left, <laughs> but if you do, uh, they may not be as familiar with some of the things we're talking about. But if they went to law school in the 1980s, especially in the later 80s, they will know about plain English. They may not know the term, but they will know these concepts. The old style of, of legal writing that we kind of think legal writing is like, with lots of heretofores and part of the first part and here and afters, that stuff has really gone largely by the wayside. Right, good legal writing is clean and crisp and simple and transparent. It should be something that a layperson can understand uh, pretty readily. Um, and so that is the goal when we write. Um, and when you fall short of that goal, when you make it so that the, the layperson or even the other legal professional has difficulty understanding, it's not good legal writing, it's bad legal writing, okay? So keep in mind the plain English writing is our goal. And let's look at the features. And again, these aren't unique to legal writing. We want to use everyday words when we can. These are going to be short words, words that people use uh, routinely in their conversation. Let me give you an example. Instead of saying minute, we're going to say small or little. Instead of saying, um, uh, uh, what would be another example? Uh, 
instead of saying uh, automobile, we might say car. There's nothing wrong with saying automobile, but you get the idea. Usually these words are going to be relatively short. Um, and they're the types of words that most people have in their everyday spoken vocabulary. Sentences also should be short. We're going to see some guidelines about this in another slide. Um, it, there's nothing wrong with having a sentence that's a little bit longer um, occasionally, but your average sense, sentence should be relatively short. And it's very effective to have occasionally a sentence that's very short, three words your reader will remember that sentence. It will cause him or her to stop. It will make an impression. And so using very short sentences occasionally can be very powerful. You want to use them strategically for the really important idea, but that will be very memorable. Um, you want to use active voice. I cover that topic in another um, broadcast. You want to use regular print. When I mean this, you want to use a, a font that's very readable. And that isn't, you don't want to use a ton of italics or bold or underlining um, in your legal uh, documents. You'll underline and italicize sometimes for blue booking, but other than that, there's not a lot of that. Maybe in headings you might use it. Um, in terms of prints, most legal professionals prefer a, a print with serifs on it, like I'm using here. I'm using Times New Roman. There's Garamond's another nice font with serifs. Arial is a little bit too informal and those types of fonts without serifs, they look more like handwriting. And again, we're looking for more of a print, more of a polished look to our documents. And so generally you'll see legal writing with, with um, and when I say serifs, what I mean is, uh, you can see on this M here, there's little feet on the M, and there's a little kind of um, flag here on the um, uh, this first stroke of the M. If it were an, an, a non-serif print, it would look like the way you and I write the M. There wouldn't be little feet on it, and there wouldn't be this little flag on it. So, uh, but again, you'll use whatever the, the font is that your law firm prefers, and so you won't have to think a lot about that one. Personal pronouns are a controversial issue. If you grew up in my generation, you were told never, ever, ever to use personal pronouns in writing. That is not to your, you know, grandma or to a family friend that it's unprofessional to use personal pronouns. And when I say personal pronouns, I'm speaking about the particular personal pronouns, I, me, my, you, your, yours, those types of pronouns, not the he, she, it's. Um, legal writing is now more open to personal pronouns than they once were, than, than legal writing once was. Um, you still want to test your waters. You still want to make sure that your law firm is the type of law firm that's okay with personal pronouns. Some of the more traditional ones probably wouldn't be, um, but some of, of the smaller ones probably are fine with it. Similarly with judges, you got to know your audience. There are some judges that aren't going to like personal pronouns, like I, me, my, you, yours. In, in particularly in court papers. And I would say that, that probably our court system isn't ready for that level. But in, in uh, legal memoranda and things like that, sometimes personal pronouns can be okay if that's something your law firm is cool with. So I just wanted to, to free you up a little bit to consider using it in the right circumstance with the right audience. We want to avoid legalese. Um, again, was obviously if we're using everyday language, we want to avoid legal terms. So Things like res ipsa loquitur. Now, if you go to law school, you'll know what res ipsa loquitur means. Literally means in Latin, the thing speaks for itself. Its meaning in a, a lot legal context is a little bit more specific. Um, legal professionals know what this term means, but it's not something they use every day. And their understanding of the term is probably... Um, you know, they, they know it like 80% of the way, but they don't know every single in and out of it. And so it's better to use the everyday words. Obviously, if you're speaking with your client or a non-legal professional, you're not going to say res ipsa loquitur. You're going to explain what it means. But even with legal professionals, um, you're probably not going to use that term unless that is what the case is about. You're also going to avoid terms like this. Um, 
again, traditionally you would have seen these play in the 1970s or 60s in legal documents, but um, uh, most legal professionals have called these out of their forms. You want to avoid saying something more than once. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be powerful to say something more than once. And certainly um, you might say a fact in the fact section or repeat that in your analysis section, that's fine. But um, within a particular section, um, usually we're not going to get into a lot of repetition. Um, you may have seen contracts that seem to say the same thing again and again and again. In this presentation, we're not talking about contracts. Um, and the rules about writing effective contracts are very different than this. So a lot of the advice I'm giving here today doesn't apply to writing contracts and wills, but uh, more to documents that are explaining the law or trying to persuade someone about the law, not documents that create legal relationships. We want to make positive statements, and by that I don't mean that we're supposed to be Pollyanna, I mean we're supposed to avoid negation. Negative statements or sentences that have a lot of negation in them may be grammatically correct, but they're much more difficult to understand. So if you have more than one negative word in a sentence, you probably ought to call it. Uh, for example, um, if I were to say something like, that statute is not unclear. Well, I use not, which is a negation, and I use unclear, which starts with un, which is a, a, a negative uh, prefix. And so I said not unclear. Well, if something is not unclear, it means it's clear. So instead of saying not unclear, say the statute is clear. Or if you feel like that's too strong of a statute, you might water it down by saying um, fairly clear, you know, or something along those lines. But you want to avoid those uh, excessive use of negative expressions. You'll see sentences, and I have some examples here in this document, where there may be three or four negative words. Even though they're grammatically correct, they're almost impossible for our brains to process because our brains like positive statements. And so, um, you may want to do a count of sentences. And if you find there's more than one negative word in the sentence, and this would include prefixes, then it's a good practice to, to figure out a way to rewrite the sentence. Okay, now I'm going to skip over a lot of the examples and other stuff that we're covering here today. I give you in these documents the example and a way of revising them. You may want to spend time on that to get a gist of what I mean with how to uh, tweak the legal writing. Uh, but also keep in mind um, that you'll cover more of this in, in later classes. I'm not going to ask you on the test to uh, make sentences shorter. So that's why I'm kind of skipping over this. And if we had had more time in class, I would have, we would have gone through some of these sentences and worked on them together. Another thing to keep in mind, I don't actually have this in the PowerPoint, but is we don't use quotations very much. Um, a very, uh, it, it's much better to paraphrase a source than to quote it word for word, unless it's a statute or a very pithy line from a case. Um, so you, you don't want to have extensive sections where you're quoting. Um, after all, the reader can read the statute on his or her own. Um, so if all you're doing is just cutting and pasting the statute or cutting and pasting the case, well, there's really no need for you to do anything. Just point them to that case. So your commentary on it is actually acting like a secondary source. You're helping the reader process that pretty challenging legal material. And so you don't want to have much of a quote. Rule of thumb I use is you shouldn't have more than one quote a page. There's nothing magical about that. If it's a little snippet of say four words, you could probably do that maybe even twice or three times in a document in a particular page. Um, but if you're quoting say a whole sentence or um, or anything longer than that, uh, one one quote a page is a good rule of thumb. And if you can reduce it from there, that's even better. Uh, there's nothing wrong with quoting, but you have you want your, your main material to be what you're saying and not what someone else is saying. Um, so let's look at this one. This is our second important slide. So we want our average length to be 20 words or less. Less would be great, but we don't want every sentence to be 20 words. And so you want to have a few that are, you know, seven words long. 
and then maybe a few that are 23, 24 words long. Um, if you're up to 30 words, I think you need to do some surgery. You need to break that up into two sentences. Um, even if it's a very um, a lovely sentence and a very clear sentence, no sentence that's 30 words is that clear. We're going to talk about nominalizations at a pretty uh, significant length, but I'm going to skip that. We're going to come back to this one later on. And um, I'm going to continue on. We're going to want to have transitions. Transitions helps the reader process what she's just read to prepare her for the next paragraph, for the next sentence. And as we do this sentence by sentence, and as this paragraph by paragraph. It helps summarize what's been read and it helps show connections between one paragraph and another. So transitions are important. It's not something you need to worry about in your first draft or even your second or third draft, but when you're to your maybe next to last draft, that's when you start thinking, well, how am I going to work in transitions? When I talk about transitions, what am I talking about? Well, sometimes it's as simple as saying first, da 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 da, -da second, Da, da 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 third da 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 or saying in conclusion or saying um, maybe you have one paragraph where you make one point and now you want to show an exception to that point an exception comma however comma exists however can be that transitional word it can be as short as a word uh, a transition could be a complete sentence depending upon the circumstances there's lots of, of neat tools out there you can just google uh, transitional phrases and find a whole list of them. If transitions are something that's a bit of an opportunity for you, my suggestion is to print out one of those sheets that you Google and just post it by your workstation and so you'll just have it handy uh, to, to pull up. Uh, many of us, and I include myself in this, fall into a rut with transitions. We, we always use this transition or that transition. And it's good to vary, it, especially within a particular document. We don't want to constantly be saying thus um, or however. We want to see if we can come up with a different one. So that list can kind of help us, almost like a thesaurus would help us vary our words. Uh, it, a list of transitions can help us be a little bit more creative. Paragraph length also should be relatively short. Generally, you want to have just one goal for your paragraph. While you don't want to have a single sentence paragraph, um, you can have a two sentence paragraph. That's okay. And so you ought to think to yourself, what do I want the reader to leave this paragraph knowing or wanting to do or thinking about? What's that one thing? And if there's two things, then you need to break it up into two paragraphs, um, almost always. Now, if the two are very closely related, you know, sometimes the, the differences between those may be very small, you might be able to keep them together. But as a general rule, one idea, one paragraph. Um, so keep that in mind as you work on your paragraphs. Um, use that topic sentence. Again, we've talked about how to structure. Um, a one paragraph essay um, earlier in the course and so all of that guidance remains in place. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead to 36. We'll return to nominalizations in a few minutes. Again, I'm not going to go through these examples yet. Here I went too far. 38 is where I wanted to go. Sorry, not 36. Okay, so pronouns. We've talked about um, antecedents in another lecture please be sure to watch that. It's important that every pronoun that is third person and definite has an antecedent. It will usually be a noun. It will usually be a noun or another pronoun. Um, and so be sure that you follow that rule. Antecedent means it has to occur before. It doesn't have to be in the same sentence. It's a best practice probably for it to appear in that paragraph. Um, you know, possibly if it's the last sentence in the paragraph above it and then the next sentence, um, you could probably get away with that. But you have to remember if you're moving around sentences and paragraphs, sometimes um, the, the antecedent might not be where it once was. So a good practice is, is one of your edits is to um, look for all of your third person, this, the, uh, 
uh, definite pronouns. These would be he, she, it, they, them, their, um, him, her, its, his, hers, all of those, and go through and find that antecedent to make sure it's unambiguous and that it matches in terms of number and gender and that it's reasonably close and before the pronoun. Again, this is something I covered in a different lecture. Another thing to watch out for is sexist language. Um, we want to use gender neutral language when we can. So instead of saying policeman, even if the person is a male, we would rather use police officer. Instead of fireman, we're going to use firefighter. Um, it's also, you know, if you again grew up in my era, the pronoun he, she, excuse me, he, him, his, uh, was oftentimes used to refer to both men and women. That convention has largely gone by the wayside. Um, nowadays, when people see he, him, his, they think male gender. They don't think could also include female gender. And so you, you can no longer effectively use he when you mean he or she. You can, of course, use he or she, or you can change around and say she or he. Both work. Um, so avoid using solely masculine pronouns, unless, of course, the group you're talking about is only masculine. So um, those are the topics that I had for this presentation. Now I'm going to go back to slide 26 and talk about nominalization. Okay, so nominalization is a word that means um, taking a another part of speech like a verb or an adjective or an adverb and making it into a noun and the way that we do this in English typically is by adding a suffix and here are some common suffixes we have for this um, nominalizations are not grammatically incorrect um, but many times they are stylistically poor choices um, they cause a couple of pro well actually cause three problems. First of all, they make the individual word long. And remember, we're trying for the everyday short word. So if you're adding a suffix to it, you're not keeping your word short. And sometimes you're not keeping them kind of everyday oriented. So that's one problem with nominalizations. Another problem with nominalizations is that you take the energy away from the sentence. This occurs especially when you start with a verb and then you add a suffix and make it a noun. So we want the energy in our sentences to be in our verbs. In other words, we want the sentence to be Bob stabbed Larry, not um, Bob did a stabbing of Larry. That's kind of a bad <laughs> sentence overall. But you can see how when we have the energy, the activity in the verb, it creates a much better um, mental image. It's, it seems like there's more activity and more vigor to the sentence. Using nominalizations also makes, typically causes you to need more words in your sentence, which of course undermines a short sentence idea. Now, you will not get rid of all nominalizations from your sentence, nor should you even try. There are plenty of times you're going to use nominalizations. But if you're like me, you could benefit from reducing the number of nominalizations that you use. One of the, I think the reasons why we're drawn to nominalizations is that it sounds kind of formal and it sounds really kind of educated if we use nominalizations. And so sometimes when we're writing, we kind of forget that plain English idea and we decide oh this is going to make me sound like I'm super well educated this is what it's going to impress my reader your goal is not to impress your reader your goal is to communicate with your reader yes you can impress your reader by having amazing grammar but don't think you're impressing your reader at least not your sophisticated reader by using nominalizations so generally speaking we want to avoid most of them we'll still use some but we want to avoid most. It's interesting that the word nominalization is actually a nominalization because you can see it ends with ION. Um, and so if you were to actually remove T -A -A -T -I -O -N, you see you have the word nominalize. That's the verb form uh, to make a, another part of speech into a noun. 
we're most focused in this course with with the verbs that become nouns as i said before it's possible to nominalize adjectives and adverbs but that's not what we're focusing on we're focusing on the verb to noun path these are the suffixes to look for oftentimes i'm sorry let me go back oftentimes there will be a t or s in front of this one there will be an e or an a in front of this one just for points of reference okay so let's look at some nominalizations we will provide appropriate information to shareholders concerning. So we have this word as a nominalization. We can immediately recognize it because it ends in ION and it's a really long word. We can also see that it's a noun and that this part of the word is a perfectly good verb. So we can rewrite this sentence and have it as a much more vigorous sentence. Let's just see how many letter words we have here. One, two, three, four, five six seven eight we have eight words let's go to our next slide we will inform shareholders about so we're providing um we're, we're removing the word appropriate um so i suppose you could say there's a slight change in meaning but we're going from eight words to one two three four five five words and we've reduced the length of this word significantly so it's probably about half the length and it's just a much more engaging and vig a vigorous sentence with this improvement. Now, information is obviously an everyday word. So, you know, this doesn't really, using the word information doesn't really cause a problem with plain English. It just, again, saps that energy from the sentence. We will have no stock ownership of the company. So what we have here is that ship suffix. And we know it's a, a, a nominalization because it ends with ship and it's a relatively long word that's a noun so let's see how and we get we have one two three four five six seven eight nine nine words and now here you can see we have one two three four five six seven words so we've saved two words we've um called this word appreciably and even though we only reduced two words you can see it's significantly shorter it's almost the same length even though we have this beginning here so um, much more vigorous interesting easy to understand sentence there is a possibility of prior board approval of these investments we have a few um, nominalizations here this is technically a nominalization but it's of um, an adjective and so we're focusing on verbal ones we have another one here with approval we can see the al ending this is a noun and we can see that here is a verb approve and this is also a nominalization we have the ment ending and we can see it's a noun and we can see if we lop this off, we have a verb, invest. Um, but we're gonna focus on this one. This is the one we really need to change for this sentence. And I realize this is something you'll develop more experience in as you progress. So let's just see how many words we have here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven words. And the board might approve these investments in advance. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've saved three words. We can see possibility has become might. Approval has become approve. We didn't change investments though. And that's okay. You know, again, nominalizations are not the the worst thing ever. When you have three sentences with them though, especially two that are verbs, you probably want to, to at least get rid of one or two of those. And we're not going to do that. So at this point, we are done with this presentation. We'll have another presentation over the second half of this uh, PowerPoint. So I thank you for your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to stop by my office hours. Just 
um, send me an email and we'll get together and, and talk about whatever your questions are or ask them when we meet as a class. Thanks so much for your attention. Have a wonderful day.